Howdy everyone. In this video, I'm going to review part two of the four part series of Python courses that Georgia Tech has made available on edX. I'll go through the pluses and minuses of the course and whether it's something you might consider. And as indicated, this is part two in the series of four courses. And this presupposes having done part one or having the knowledge involved in part one. Basically, you need to know the fundamentals and very, very basics of Python in order to do part two, but otherwise it's relatively approachable. Now I'll include links to these in the description below so you can check them out if you're interested in doing so, but otherwise let's jump into the course and see exactly what it involves. And when I go through this, I'm going to talk about what the course has in it, the course content. I'll talk about the pluses, i.e. the benefits of doing it, and also what I think and like about the course and some of the things that could be improved in the course. And overall, it's definitely one that I would put at the top of my list of things to consider if I were trying to learn how to program in Python. So let's have a look at the course itself. So here we are on edX. And basically what you can see here is we are looking at learn the fundamentals of computer science. And this is part of the professional certificate uh, component that Georgia Tech has made available. Now this professional certificate itself as I indicated, has several courses in it. There are four skill building courses, and you can progress at your own speed, i.e. it's asynchronous, and it's supposedly going to take five months to complete. However, I've completed two of these parts in two weeks, i.e. a half of it in two weeks, so that time period is kind of, if you're doing it, kind of hit and miss. The price will vary over time, and it's going to depend a lot on your location as well. So, if you're looking at the components of it, we've got the four components, and I mentioned these when I mentioned part one as well. So we had part one, which I've already talked about, and part one, fundamentals. Part two, which is going to be the subject for this video, is computing in Python and control structures. Then after this, you've got other more complicated issues in terms of data structures, and then in terms of algorithms. So if we dig deep into part two, which is the topic that we're going to be looking at at the moment, we can see some basic information about part two. Now in part two, if you were to do it yourself and by itself, you could do that and just get a course certificate for that part too, if that's all you're interested in. The start dates are neither here nor there. You can start whenever you want. It's just defaulting to the recording date at the moment. Now, as it's indicated, I've already enrolled in the course. Now this course itself is supposedly going to last five weeks. However, like I indicated, I did it in about five to six days. You can add a verified certificate if you want. I generally do add a verified certificate because I find that it somewhat motivates me to do it, and then I can record it on LinkedIn. So if anyone would Google search or search in LinkedIn Python, maybe I'll come up, maybe. But in any case, I've got the verified certificate added to mine when I enrolled in the professional certificate. Now, if we go down, there's a little bit of information about it. The syllabus here is pretty vague. I, the syllabus kind of tells you what the courses do. However, it might be a little bit easier to actually look at this when we go to my enrolled or enrollment page, and you'll see this in a little bit more detail as to what it has. So let's go over to my course enrollment page, and then we are able to see what it actually has in it. So in the course itself, there are several modules. We have firstly, a basic introduction to control uh, structures. This is super basic, not really that much to say about it. The second substantive one is conditionals i.e. if-then statements and the like. Then we have loops, which are going to be for loops and while loops. And then after we've got the for loops and the while loops, we go on to functions. This is where you'll be defining a function. So for example, if you want to define a basic function to add, you would define it there. Or you could define many different functions. And there are many examples that it goes through about what functions you can define. And then finally, we get to error handling, i.e. Say you're programming something and you don't want it to crash out every time something goes wrong and you want it to actually report you something of worth when something goes wrong, error handling helps to get at this with the try, exception, and finally uh, structures that are put together to deal with errors. So those are the four overarching uh, areas we'll be dealing with, conditionals, loops, functions, and error handling. Now, clearly for copyright reasoning, I am not going to show you everything in it, but I think it's going to be perfectly fine with them if I kind of show you like what's roughly in each of these. So let's go to functions here as one example. Now, if we go to functions, what you'll immediately see when I expanded it is you have the course material itself, and then 
at the end of each section, there is a problem set. And that problem set goes into an assessment, which I'll talk to in just a second. Then if we go into the actual course material itself, what happens in each course, and something I very much like, is that there will be, in each section, short videos. Each of these videos is maybe a minute or two. Some of them are longer, but they're short. And there'll be a few videos, all of which are short and bite-sized, so you don't get too bored with them. And then, off times at the end of a section, there'll be some form of exercise. The exercise may be large or it might be small, but it gives you an idea and an ability to test what you have done. And there are going to be myriad exercises throughout the course, which then enable you to do the problem set at the end of each section. And then at the end of each section, you're going to be able to do the exam. This then leads me on to how is it that you complete the course? What do you need to do to pass this course and potentially get your verified certificate? Well, in reality, it is not terribly difficult. There are four problem sets, and you need to do each of these four problem sets, uh, or at least you need to have attempted each of the problem sets. Those problem sets are very easy in that you have pretty much unlimited times to get the answer correct. Then there is a test at the end, which is the timed 2R test. So here you can see it on my progress screen, where on my progress screen, it's basically saying I have done each of these four problem sets, and then it gives me an average for these, then I've done the test, and then there's a total score. The test here goes for two hours, and well, you have to do it in the two hours. You don't really have the ability to repeat questions ad infinitum. Most things have limited numbers of attempts, and you only have a certain time period. And then this will go into your total. You obviously need to pass the course in order for you to get your verified certificate. The assessment here is not terribly difficult, but it is authentic to use a buzzword, in that a lot of the things within the assessment are relatively representative of the types of things you might expect to see at a very basic level in the real world. Many of them are coding exercises where you need to put together things in order to code a very short program. And that's basically what the assessment ultimately looks like. So let's think about the course and think about whether it's the type of thing you might want to do. So I'll start off with the positives. There are several major positives. Firstly, the material is relatively well presented. It's thorough. The lecturer of this, David Joyner, explains everything very clearly with where relevant analogies and metaphors to help convey material. Secondly, it's interactive with plenty of examples so that you are going to be relatively easily able to apply all of the knowledge you learn, i.e. it's not just theoretical. Thirdly, all of the lectures are short. With online courses, particularly asynchronous courses, it can be very painful to listen to an hour-long lecture. Now that's fine when you're sitting in a theater and you can raise your hand and ask questions, or you can interact, but when you can't interact, if you're like me, you'll zone out. So the short bite-sized lectures are brilliant to my mind. So pedagogically, it is very well done in terms of the small lectures, continual exercises and refinement, and then the assessments which you are prepared for, and also which do represent, albeit at a basic level, the types of things that might arise in reality. So overall, I think it is very well structured and very well done. The negatives about how it's done are that it sometimes takes longer to get to the point than it needs to, i.e. it belabors the point a little bit too much for some things. I feel like for some concepts, it could go over them quicker. I feel like for some concepts, they would be better off starting off each area with saying, this is the specific syntax for defining a function. So for example, functions, you would start off with def, then you'd have the function name, then in parentheses, you'd have the things that go into the function. Then at the beginning of it, you have particular types of things that you need to put in, and then the next thing you'll have parameters for which you can define various default settings. Then you'll do a colon and then start off underneath that with the contents of your function. So if it were to state the syntax up front more clearly, then it could potentially take less time getting its point across. So that would be my main complaint with it, sometimes a little bit too long-winded. The next question is, is it useful for you? Well, this really depends on whether you need Python. If you're in business and you need tech skills, so coding skills for quantitative finance, and you don't have Python skills, then this course would be for you because it would help you learn those skills. If you are looking to develop 
Python skills for whatever real world reason you need, then this course could be for you because you'd need Python skills. And if you're trying to pick up Python for whichever career oriented reason you have, then this course would make a lot of sense. If, however, you already know a lot about Python, then this course would be too basic for you. Potentially, if you've already coded in other languages, this course might be a little bit too slow moving for you. If, for example, you're already an expert in Java or C++, you probably already are familiar with the basic concepts of control structures. You probably don't need it to go into as much detail as slowly as this course does. Rather, you probably just need a bit of a syntax refresher if you already can code in another language like that. But if you're mainly used to statistical software, then this course is going to be more appropriate for you. So the answer is, is the answer to, is this course appropriate for you, is, it depends on what you need to gain from the course, to be totally clear. But if you need to gain Python skills, and you're not already a coding expert, then this course could easily be a good option for you. And it could easily accomplish your goals there. So those are my thoughts about this Python course from Georgia Tech available via edX and about part two of the Python professional certificate. I'll include a link to this in the description below for those of you who want to check it out. But otherwise, I hope the video has been informative to you and I hope it's given you some idea about whether or not this type of Python course is worth taking. And in any case, thank you so much for tuning in and I hope to see you for future videos as well. Bye.